How's it going everybody? It's Riley's Red Zone here back with another Red Zones roster previews episode and in today's video I'm going to be taking a look at the Denver Broncos. So like in previous episodes I break down every single player on this team and I predict whether they will make the roster and have an impact whether they will make the practice squad or be cut from the team. And then we also take a look at the schedule. I predict how many games they will win. And I also give out some awards to their top players that fit that category. So you can see all the previous episodes in this top corner if you have not seen them already. And with that being said, I'm going to jump right into talking about the Denver Broncos. So first, like I've done in previous episodes, let's talk about the coaching and the staff and the culture around the Broncos right now. And so they have Vic Vangio, who is a defensive-minded head coach. And it makes sense because their defense is their strength. I'm going to say right off the bat, their defense is one of the best in the league. And if it weren't for the quarterback position, this team would probably be in the playoff tier, if not even higher. So I truly think it's the offense that might be holding them back this year. But they've constructed a good defense. They've only added more and more to it. So... He's done a good job on the defensive side of the ball. It's just, can they get the offensive side actually going this year? Uh, and it all comes down to that quarterback position. So I feel like this is a decent opportunity here to really see, is it working out with Vic Vangio? Is he doing a good job on the defense? And do we, are we just a quarterback away from really being an elite team? So I really think he's been okay so far. And you honestly, like I said, can't judge everything so far because they haven't had an elite quarterback and really a great offense to really balance things out so if we're going straight off the defense I'd say they've been pretty solid um, so let's start talking about the players starting with the quarterback position two two episodes back to back where we have quarterback competitions and this one prime you know a little less valuable with the players that are here and it's a, cl- I would call it a closer competition, but I think we know who it's going to be. It's just basically, will Drew Locke do something to lose the job? Basically, the, once again, this this team, this is pretty good. Their defense is solid. This quarterback position is what it comes on down to, and why they're ranked at this position and not higher. So you have two options. You have Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater. And as I also mentioned in the previous episode with the Bears and their quarterback um, contest, really, it always seems like if you have a quarterback competition, your backup's going to be one of the best in the league. But two does not equal one, so you need to pick one and roll with it. And I do think in this situation it will be Drew Locke. Now, the reason for that is his ceiling is higher. Coming into the season, this offseason, I actually thought Teddy Bridgewater would be a better choice. I feel like he's safer, has more experience. But what we saw in the preseason game, I actually had a chance to see the Broncos in a joint practice with the Minnesota Vikings in person. Uh, And it did seem like the offense was rolling a little better with Drew Locke at the moment and just because of the familiarity. And it really comes down to the ceiling with Drew Locke is higher, the floor with Teddy Bridgewater is higher. So this team, if they view the defense as elite, that they're ready to go and they just need somebody safe, to me, you go with Teddy Bridgewater. He's safer. He's going to be able to run the offense well, but doesn't necessarily have the upside, doesn't have an elite arm, not very familiar with the system exactly. So I can see where maybe he would be the backup. It's basically going to come down to Drew Locke had a great preseason game. I'd say it's his job right now. To me, it comes down to, does Drew Locke make too many mistakes? Does he do something to lose his job? Because that is where I think we are at this point in the QB competition. And I thought Drew Locke was going to step up last year. I truly did. If I would have made a breakout video last year, he was up there. I thought he was going to be that next second-year quarterback, third-year quarterback now this year, like to really break out. And I still think he could this year, but this is this is the year for Drew Locke. They've surrounded him with some top talent. They have a great defense. This is the year for him that if he does not succeed, you need to reset. And so it comes down to that where if the defense and the other, you know, pass catching 
players on this team proved to be were ready to go and compete for the playoffs, to me, if Drew Locke is making mistakes and turnovers, that's when you need to turn it back over to Teddy Bridgewater. Because if this is a team that truly feels like they are ready to compete, I would just go with Teddy Bridgewater because he's safer. He won't cost you any games, but he also won't win you any. And that's what I think they want in Drew Locke. So uh, I do think that Drew Locke will be the starting quarterback. I would probably at some point go with Teddy Bridgewater, but if you are going to go with Drew Locke, you might as well stick with him for that whole time. They also have Brett Rippon, who's been okay, honestly, when given opportunities. I just don't see them keeping three quarterbacks, so I'm going to keep him on the practice squad, but he's a solid developmental player. But it, it really, two does not equal one, and you're just hoping that maybe the pressure of having somebody with Bridgewater gives Locke a little pressure. I mean, last year it was clear they believed in Drew Locke. I still think they want Drew Locke to be their guy. It's just they brought in somebody to push him farther and just be somebody that if Locke is struggling again, they can turn to Teddy Bridgewater. But I do think Drew Locke starts, and I think that they will go with him for probably a huge majority of the season. But I will say if he does start struggling, then they move to Teddy Bridgewater. So I don't, I just, bottom line, I don't think Locke has his breakout season. And uh, he's going to be okay, kind of like uh, a Jameis Winston-ish type of player where he, I feel like he's going to be high risk, high reward, where he might end up just being like a high quality backup. Winston now might be starting, and I actually feel good about him now that he's had some time to develop. But I feel like that could be a similar career arc for Drew Locke. I'm not, even if he struggles, I'm not going to rule out him starting again in the future. So an interesting quarterback position. Now it helps him to be surrounded by top talent on other spots on the offense, starting with your running backs. You have Melvin Gordon, who has not necessarily been elite since coming over from the Chargers. I was shocked that he signed with the Broncos when they had Phillip Lindsay at the time. And he, he just hasn't really done a whole lot here, and his job may be threatened with Javante Williams, who they took in the second round, who has turned out he had a great week one preseason, looked really, really solid. He's had a good camp as well. I do think that this job by the end of the year could be turned over to Javante Williams, but if not by next year. So uh, Melvin Gordon is still a decent back at this point in his career, but I think that he will kind of maybe slowly be turning into like just a goal line, short yardage power back in this offense because Javante is just a lot more explosive. He offers more in the receiving game, and I think that by the end of the year, they'll end up giving him all the opportunities. So if for fantasy purposes, I talk a little bit about fantasy in uh, this series. I It might be worth taking a shot on Javante Williams. I'm not super confident in drafting Melvin Gordon very early, so watch out for Javante to take over the job. Uh, I don't think he'll win it outright right away, but by the end of the year, you could see some momentum there. I also have them keeping Mike Boone, who they just brought in this year from the Vikings. He is a very fast player, speedy, and I think he could end up being a part of the receiving game and maybe just some outside runs in space. Could potentially be his role on this team. So I feel confident in him potentially making this team and just being a role player, can also play special teams. Then Royce Freeman was barely making the team in this situation he's a power back uh, has just not really been given opportunities on this team there's always been somebody better above him uh, but even so he just hasn't been elite he's kind of just a, a slower probably power goal line back so I feel fine if you end up letting go of him but I am going to keep him as that fourth running back to, so you kind of bounce out you have Gordon and Freeman for power and you have Williams and Boone for speed and receiving ability they also have Demarie Crockett who performed very very well in the preseason game this past week and so I think he proved uh, a reason on why he should potentially at least be in the rotation here for this team they recently bring in Adrian Killens. They had Levante Bellamy on uh, for depth pieces, and they wave injured him, I believe. So Adrian Killens they bring in from the Eagles. He's a speedy player as well, but I just feel like there's not enough time for him to make an impact. And then they also have a fullback in Adam Prentice. I'll talk about the fullback position in a bit as they have a guy who can play fullback and tight end. I chose to go that route. So 
I like this running back room a lot. It has a lot of depth to it. I do think it will be Javante Williams' job by the end of the year, and that is where they should be going in the future. Mike Boone was a decent signing as well. So overall, a, a solid running back room. It's where are you going to get the contributions right away. I think that Williams, by the end of the year, will be the number one running back. Now moving on to the receivers, it's... A interesting room. It's an interesting room because you get Cortland Sutton back, who missed all of last year due to an injury, and that is huge for them to get their number one receiver back. You know, Jerry Judy now won't have to carry uh, the wide receiver room. So I like that having that back. But then they have just a bunch of young guys who are kind of competing for the roster spots. I'll kind of go through here. And so you really can go with a number of combos. But let's so Cortland Sutton, having him back as a number one receiver, great for them. He can make some spectacular catches, make some good jump ball plays. I feel really, really good in him being back now and it balances this out offense out with now Jerry Judy, who's a great route runner. Maybe didn't perform year one up to some of the other receivers but I feel like this year he really is going to step into his own and he can definitely prove to be an elite route runner and great catch I feel like he can be good over the middle and just be a security blanket for Drew Locke at this point Tim Patrick has performed pretty well been given opportunities honestly over the past few years he is a physical player he's on the bigger side And he's definitely a physical jump ball guy who I feel like will be impactful in the red zone as he has been before. Stepped up last year when Sutton went down. And I feel he's proved to really have a role carved out for him in this offense. They also have KJ Hamler, who I've been waiting to really step up and wanted him to get some opportunities. And he did, you know, he had a great play in the preseason game against the Vikings, a huge deep pass uh, that, he caught for a touchdown from Drew Locke, a beautiful, uh, well, it, it, there was a miscommunication, I think, on the Vikings side for the deep coverage, but still, just great to see the speed from Hamler, I've been waiting to see that since he was picked, and finally, I think he's going to be given an opportunity to show what he has, so I feel extremely confident in KJ Hamler, now, those are my only locks, Drew Locks, I guess, okay, that was, that was a terrible fun, but um, those four, I feel extremely confident in pretty much a guarantee to make the roster. Now it's competing for the next five, uh, your fifth receiver, the sixth receiver. Um, and they have, I would say five guys competing for that to get the last two spots. Now my favorites for the job originally were going to be probably Seth Williams and Tyree Cleveland, but now Trinity Benson had a solid preseason game he he looked really really good both on offense and in the special teams ability as well um so I feel really really good in him now maybe being potentially one of your returners so I'm keeping him around for that special teams ability he fought his way onto the team for me this week uh they also have Seth Williams who they took late in the draft this year out of Auburn his focus is going to be speed maybe a deep route runner potentially uh so I I'm choosing to keep him as a late-round flyer versus who they took last year in Tyree Cleveland. Tyree Cleveland, also a quick player, um, did not get any action really last year. Not much much really to get time on the field. So he's kind of behind now, I feel like. And then they have Kendall Hinton, who you probably remember from the quarterback situation last year when everybody was out and then he had to play. Um, I feel like he still is a practice squad level receiver, and I mean, he did not do well, obviously, at quarterback. He got like one completion. I remember I tried starting him in fantasy that week at wide receiver. I was thinking I was finessing the system, but he did pretty much nothing. Uh, But, you know, I mean, with everything going on, we saw the Vikings QB situation where they were missing a bunch of players. Having a guy with some QB experience isn't the worst, even if he didn't do uh, the very well. So... Uh, They also have Deontay Spencer, who is maybe a returner. That's why I feel like Trinity Benson has kind of taken that spot from Deontay Spencer is really what I'm thinking happened. And so I think you can go with two of the three 
between Benson, Williams, and Cleveland would be who would be my favorites to make the roster for those last two spots behind the top four. They also have a few other players that have been cut, but this is a solid receiver room, and they just have a variety of skill sets, a number of players who are looking to step up, and I'm happy specifically for Hamler and Benson to be given opportunities, and then Judy, I think, also will take a step up. Those guys getting more development to me is key, and uh, I think this receiver room is very, very solid for that reason, and another reason why Drew Locke, this is a make-or-break-it year for you, and if you don't perform, he could be on the way out. So let's move on to the tight end room where let's start with Noah Fant. He's been, I'd say, solid. Uh, they took him in the first round a few years ago. He's been pretty good. Um, I would say not as good as his Iowa teammate TJ Hawkinson at this point in his career. I feel like Hawkinson stepped up last year. Uh, but still, Fant has been a solid player, can deal with the drops sometimes. But I think he's really developed into a, a solid Starting tight end, a good fantasy option in this offense. Clearly his tight end room here, he's just had more time to develop. I also liked them picking Albert Okwegbunam last year in the draft. And he finally will be given an opportunity to be just a top two tight end. And he could potentially be a good goal line receiving uh, threat. I feel like with his size, he could potentially do that. They also have Eric Saubert, who to me is more of a blocking type. He also did get some action at receiver uh, well, receiving at tight end this past preseason game, but I feel like he can potentially impact the blocking game. And then they also have Andrew Beck, who they have both at fullback and tight end. I feel like he's going to be, if they do have a fullback on this roster, probably it's going to be Andrew Beck. So blocking there from the bottom too, I feel like Fant is just a quick receiver and Albert Okwegbunam can be kind of that basketball type, um, just go up and get it. Uh, get the rebounds at the goal line kind of uh, just go up and get those tough catches so they also have Austin Fort I'm keeping on the practice squad barely have them cutting Sean Byer and this is a solid tight end room as I mentioned just a variety of skills I love the upside of both Fant and Okwegbunam so I absolutely love that there the offensive line is pretty solid as well I would say it is Filled with the players that have experience, which is good to see. I would say overall they have a few young guys developing as well. So it's different, you know, than what the Bears were that we talked about last episode. Garrett Bowles has really turned his career around at left tackle here. He started as pretty much, people. I would say people were calling him a bust. He dealt with the penalty issues, but now he's really developed into a solid blocker. For this offensive line. So you actually feel pretty good with him at left tackle. Uh, Then you have Dalton Reisner. Who kind of was somewhere between a tackle and a guard. Coming out of Kansas State. But now I feel like he's a solid left guard. So I feel great in those two players. To really be solid on the offensive line. They also have Graham Glasgow. Who they brought in um, to. They brought him in last year I believe. To be a solid blocker as well. So those three are really, really solid uh, on the offensive line. They have Lloyd Cushenberry, who they picked last year out of LSU, and I think he was okay. I think he can get pushed around sometimes, but it's not bad at all. I like them doing that, but here's the thing. They have Quinn Miners as well, who can play guard and center. I would not be surprised if Quinn Miners goes ahead and takes that job right away at center either. So if Cushenberry does not perform, Miners can just go ahead and take that spot. They also bring in Bobby Massey this year. Power right tackle. They bring him in from the Bears. Solid because they were kind of, you know, they've dealt with, they had the Juwan James situation where he hasn't really played for them over the past few years. He, they were kind of relying on him to potentially be that right tackle. And he obviously was not healthy. And then they decided to get rid of him this year. There was a big controversy about that. Um, so they now have Bobby Massey at right tackle, which is a, I'd say, pretty stable starting spot then the depth here is actually pretty good they have cam fleming who has bounced around but is a solid swing tackle depth piece calvin anderson as well on the younger side could potentially take over that role natane muti i really really liked coming out of fresno state he was picked much later than i expected he was going to be so i absolutely loved that pick when it happened he's a power blocker i just don't see him getting in the starting rotation as i mentioned quinn miners 
He has a lot of upside coming out of, I think it was Wisconsin Whitewater this year. It was a small school. He can play center and guard, which is why I put him as an interior offensive lineman, which gives him great flexibility. I think that his best shot to start right away would be at the center spot. So that could potentially be in the works for him. I have them. I another borderline roster player who's I'm choosing to keep. Brett Jones has spent some time with the Vikings as just a depth piece. He could probably play guard as well, but I have him listed as just a backup center to then have Miners be your, one of your top backup guards. But solid depth on the offensive line, and also have, some, have them keeping Austin Slotman on the practice squad. And then they just have a, a lot of young players who I don't necessarily see making the team. But this is a really really good offensive line, and this is why just another example. Great supporting cast for Drew Locke. You got to see something here. Because you have a great left tackle, solid left guard, solid right guard, decent right tackle. And then you, I feel like if you put Quinn Miners in there too, they, that can be a good offensive line in the future. So I think this is a very, very solid offensive line and just, an, just another reason why Drew Locke has to perform this year. So absolutely solid on the offensive line. Moving on to the defense, let's start with talking about their defensive line in this 3-4 scheme. They have Shelby Harris, who has really proven himself to be a solid defensive lineman over the past two years, has really just kind of blossomed into a solid player, and I'm happy they brought him back because that greatly improves this defensive line because otherwise there's a bunch of good players but not startable, like consistent to me. Um, So they have him. Draymond Jones, we've been waiting to develop coming out of Ohio State. I think he's finally given an opportunity here. This year to really just prove himself. Uh, And if not, they may look to move on eventually. He just has not done a whole lot for them. They have Mike Purcell, who they have listed as a nose tackle. He can potentially be that guy right up the middle. Kind of just a veteran, solid player in the rotation. They also have Shamar Steffen, former Viking, who is kind of a... He's more so a 4-3 defensive tackle, but they're going to probably play him at defensive end here uh, in a 3-4 scheme. So he is a solid rotation guy, I would say, as well. He's not what he used to be, but a decent rotation. Love them. Still having McTelvin Aguim. That was one of my favorite choices for them. And I think finally he can get an opportunity as well. And I would honestly play him perhaps if Draymond Jones does not show up very well. I would play McTelvin Aguim there. And then I don't feel great about having Deshaun Williams or Isaiah Mack on the team here, but they're going to be their depth interior, uh, their defensive tackles, nose tackle players uh, that might, you know, I'd be willing to cut them if other spots ended up being more important. But I felt like they need a lot of depth here because they don't necessarily, Shelby Harris being your best defensive lineman isn't the greatest, but he's solid. But behind that, not a whole ton of like proven ability. They also have Marquis Spencer, who they took late in the draft this year. I'm just keeping on the practice squad. And then Jonathan Harris, who's been around for a bit here, I think just doesn't make the team. So, I mean, I, I like Shelby Harris a lot. He's improved greatly. But besides that, I don't feel great in this defensive line. And it probably is the weakness on this defense. Because if we keep looking at what else they have, um, it's absolutely loaded. So I feel like that is perhaps the weakness on this defensive line. But hey, if you can get some impact from Draymond Jones or McTelvin Aguim, you're starting to look better. It's so difficult here just finding different depth pieces. I only have them keeping three edge rushers, and I'm honestly debating still putting a fourth one in there with Jonathan Cooper. But we know Von Miller is a stud. He did deal with an injury last year. Didn't really, you know, he was hurt the whole time pretty much. So he is, I think, still solid bouncing off this injury. He still looked good in practice when I saw him, and uh, still, I feel like, can be an impact on this team. So, he is probably still their best player, maybe even on the entire team. So, I think that I'm not worried with him bouncing back off this injury. I think he still is going to be what he is at this point in his career. He's not going to be the elite game wrecker he was one, once was, but still one of the great picks they've done was putting Bradley Chubb on the opposite side. Chubb also was very dominant in practice when I saw him and just looked like a man amongst boys out there. He is just very physical and definitely is proving himself to be a great player. And I feel like if Von Miller ever does leave or retire, he can just take that mantle up. But right now he's an awesome sidekick. So I definitely think that Bradley Chubb has developed. Malika Reed has really developed as well. It's just a rotational piece. 
I if you were to keep a fourth edge rusher, you're gonna have competition here between Jonathan Cooper, who they took out of Ohio State this year, and then Derek Tuska. Uh, I feel like you could go with either of those, and I honestly want to keep four more edge rushers. I just found other spots I felt like that were more deserving, but definitely I would prefer them to keep uh, a fourth edge rusher. Perhaps I just didn't see uh, the need, I guess, with who they have, and I have them cutting a few other players, but. I think that this edge room, they could use a little bit more. I mean, the, I, I should say the depth is fine. I, it's just I find other spots on this team almost more important to keep depth at just because of how confident I am in Von Miller and Bradley Chubb. I think that's one of the best pass rushing duos in the entire league. Uh, so, you know, it'd be great for them to get some more numbers there, but I feel like who they have, Von Miller and Bradley Chubb, absolutely solid there at the edge rushing spot. Now let's talk about the linebackers, starting with Alexander Johnson, who has really developed into his own as well over the past few years. I feel like he's a solid middle linebacker for sure, who can just start to, I think, really be a field general out there on defense. Josie Jewell as well, they have coming out of Iowa a few years ago, starting to develop, and I think given opportunities here, could be solid as a tackler as well. They have Justin Stranad, who has a good amount of speed. He came out of Wake Forest. I feel like he as well could be given opportunities. You're just looking to see who in the second linebacker spot behind Alexander Johnson could really develop into something. Uh, Intriguingly, they took Baron Browning this year, who is dealing with a bit of an injury right now. But he was interesting the way they used him at Ohio State. I think they took him a bit early in the draft where I, I thought he was worth maybe a fourth round. They took him in the third. He was basically, I would honestly, with the players I watched this year, almost a budget Micah Parsons in a way because he it just he's nowhere near as fast, he's nowhere near explosive, but he did line up on the edge a bit for Ohio State. Um, he was a guy that I watched and thought was very interesting the way they used him. He he's a thumper is the way I would explain him. He is a downfield player that is gonna just offer the strength the tackling ability, but he is not particularly fast that you can line him up at the edge as well, potentially, which is why I'm only keeping three edge rushers as well. That's a reason is I feel like they could line Baron Browning out there. Um, but just still a little, uh, I would say just on the slower side, it's really his weakness. But I think between Jewel Stranad and Browning, you'll get somebody who can step up at that second linebacker position. They're throwing darts at the board, seeing what can happen. I have them cutting the other linebackers. But Alexander Johnson has really started to develop into something. And then somebody in the young, you know, between Josie Jewel, Justin Stranad, Baron Browning, I feel like steps up and proves to be in that second linebacker spot. The corners... I feel absolutely great, and this might be the, I mean, I I can't say it's the best corner room based on their starters, honestly. Like, right away you could think of the Patriots and just think of Stephon Gilmore, J.C. Jackson, Jonathan Jones, and you can think of other teams. But the de- this top five corners might be the best best potentially like I can't think of like of a five depth corner piece here this is just unbelievable Kyle Fuller unbelievable pickup I mean I was still shocked I mentioned in the last episode that the Bears chose to let him go I understand me for cap reasons but Bronco said okay fine let's just take Kyle Fuller from the Bears who Vic Vangio used to work with and turned into an elite player a few years ago and he still is a number one corner out there. And I feel pretty confident in him being this number one corner. And I, I just think it was a great signing for them. And a perfect scheme fit too. So I, I absolutely love that signing. And he looks like a number one corner out there. They bring in Ronald Darby. I thought it was a bit of an overpay for sure. But to be a number two corner, you'll take it, I guess. Um, he, he definitely, I feel like for at least this year, can be there. And then Bryce Callahan is one of the best slot corners, nickel guy, who, like, a, one of the best in the league. Potentially, uh, you know, like a top, you could say a top 20 corner based on, uh, like, overall at their position. You wouldn't want to play him on the outside, but from an interior position, he's one of the best out there. Um, so I definitely think that he is solid. And then Patrick Sertan, the second here, 
What a stud. And I just feel bad, honestly, that he won't maybe start right away. He lined up, I believe, with the second team out there. He did get a pick six in the preseason game, which is good to see for him. He was my number one corner this year. And nothing against J.C. Horn, but Sertan was the number one corner, in my opinion, this year. And I do think that in retrospect, I think the Panthers will have... They'll be close, but I think the Panthers would have rather had Patrick Sertan. And we saw it not only with the pick six, but this dude's ability to just mirror players and cover is unbelievable. Absolutely phenomenal. And I think that he was just unbelievable at Alabama. You can actually, I think, still watch my film breakdown on him. He was just dominant he would line up against the receivers he could play deep coverage he could base play short coverage he can do press he can do everything for you and I I just think that he will blossom into a top 10 corner within a number of years and I just don't it's unfortunate he won't get the playing time right away because I truly think that he is that level of player they also have Michael OJ Mudia who they took recently in the draft And he, I think, has dealt with some penalty issues, specifically this week in the game. But um, same with that practice a little bit. He looked a little physical. Um, But he also, you know, that can pay off sometimes with some nice deflections and lockdown plays. So I feel great with him being a depth piece. Um, And then, you know, they have a bunch of other young players as well swinging at the board. Parnell Motley. Kerry Vincent, they took out of LSU this year. Assigned Bassey last year, made it end t- as an undrafted rookie out of Wake Forest last year, made the team. Um, so I, I think that they have a lot of options here at corner, and I have them just keeping five because I feel so confident in that five. I mean, that is one of the best five corner rooms I have just seen probably ever, but unbelievable. I mean, to think Sertan might not even be starting and he would be a number one corner on a number of teams, that is just unbelievable. Um, let's move to the safeties here. Justin Simmons, one of the best safeties in the league, absolutely dominant. Um, he's really developed into a solid player. And it's just he can intercept the ball. He can just make plays all over the field, feel great in him. Kareem Jackson still a veteran at this point in his career. Um uh, you know, converted corner. He's played pretty well at safety. A good guy opposite Justin Simmons, but he is on the older side. So when he starts to fizzle out, they have younger players like PJ Locke, who I feel like has actually played well this week, both in the game and at practice. Same with Caden Stearns as well, who they took out of Texas this year. And then Jamar Johnson, who fell in the draft out of Indiana this year. Um, both young players that I feel like they're looking to develop. And then Trey Marshall, I think just ends up, you know, just being weeded out by these younger players, but he still is a practice squad level player to me. So they they have Justin Simmons, absolutely solid player. And then Kareem Jackson still good at this point in his career. And then you're just looking for one of those young guys to really develop. Um, And then that is what you have at the safety room. I just, I like that a lot. This defense overall, the secondary, absolutely locked down. Linebacker's pretty good. The edge rush, one of the best duos. This is just, this is an elite defense. And if they had a better quarterback, this team would probably be at least top 15, maybe top 12, top 10, like way higher than they probably should be. uh, If they, you know, like what they are right now, basically. For special teams, McManus is fine. He's kind of hot and cold. Um, He has a strong leg for sure. uh, But... You know, I feel like he can be a little inconsistent at times, but I'll t- I'll take him any day of the week at kicker. A uh, Sam Martin, solid put- punter overall, and then Jacob Boban Moyer at long snapper is okay. So uh, this roster, just to conclude it once again, solid defense. Just we need to see something from Drew Locke. If I will say, if Drew Locke can do anything like what he was expected to do coming out of the draft and like take any step up. This team is a playoff contender and could be potentially dangerous given into the playoffs. It's just what can Drew Locke do? Now let's talk about the schedule here. And wow, everybody that's been tuning into the series, we have done it. We have finally hit a green W on the screen. For you that are new to the series, you might be confused here what the 50s are. Basically what I've been doing for this series is I give automatic L's and automatic W's based on teams that are basically way higher in the ranks. And if you, you know, you might be wondering why I'm excited to see a W. This is the first W I've been able to put on the board. Uh, Just because for me, the NFL is so unpredictable. 
I started this series back in May. So, so many things have changed since then. Teams can change. Now, I've shifted ranks before a bit, but not immensely. So, it kind of is a good way to keep, like, these are close. And basically what they mean are the colors go with the other game that's that same color. So, in this situation, for example, the Jaguars and the Eagles, both are blue. That means I'm saying they're going to win one of those two games. So... Uh, a lot. Of, once we keep going higher here, we're gonna probably see a lot of 50s and start to see some W's and some L's uh, a little more often here. So this team is our first seven-win projected team. So we're taking a step up. And as I mentioned, if Drew Locke performs even well, you could definitely make this team make a case that they're a playoff contender, Super Bowl contender. Their defense is that good. So. They start on the road against the Giants and Jaguars. I've revealed both those teams. Those are both winnable. The Jets are my first, you know, automatic win for this series. Uh, so I think that they get a win over the Jets there. Ravens are still tough, though. Uh, the Steelers and Raiders, I think, are both winnable games. Potentially, I've already revealed the Raiders. Uh, the Browns are, I think, going to be good this year again. Washington football team, Cowboys, Eagles, Anybody in the NFC East is pretty much beatable for almost any team. Um, and then they have a bye week in week 11, which I absolutely love for this team because that is a perfect spot um, where I've explained it before on the series. For teams that are potentially contending for the playoffs, which is this team, for example, that might need a late playoff push, a middle of a middle of the season bye is ideal. Week 11, great. Because here's my thought process behind that. If you have an early bye you know, you're going to be going through so many games before you get to the playoffs. If you have a late buy, it may be too late to make a change. If you have a middle buy, which is why I like this, if something's not going right, it gives you more time to get on fire into the playoffs. Because to me, the key about the playoffs is who is on fire getting on a hot streak. Let's talk about last year alone, for example. The first 10 weeks of the season don't tell you who's going to win the Super Bowl. If we said that, the Steelers are undefeated for over half of the season, and then they end up losing in the first round of the playoffs pretty badly to the Browns. And so they, you know, it's all about who has the momentum. They started losing momentum into the season, uh, into the playoffs, and that really cost them. The Bucks, people were, I think, over, uh, you know, overreacting to them struggling early in the season. It's just, let's hold faith here. Let's overall just predict that what we thought preseason, preseason still can happen so if you had faith in the Bucks, they went all the way they started slow but they picked up steam and that's what it's really all about and that's what I think that the Broncos could potentially do in this situation so I love that bye week then the Chargers might be winnable for this team the Chiefs are tough then nice stretch here see this is what we're looking for some winnable games Lions, Bengals, Raiders, Chargers, all winnable games. Love to see that, closing it out. Um, and then the Chiefs are, are going to be tough. But maybe if the Chiefs rest their starters, for example, another winnable game, you're starting to get really, really close to playoff territory. So I have this team at seven wins, which is a step up over everybody else that we've gone through so far. Uh, but I think that if they're a quarterback away, this team is a quarterback away from being absolutely elite. So... Let's start talking about the awards here. I'm going to give Cortland Sutton the Offensive Player of the Year just because I don't think Drew Locke takes a step enough to make an impact. I don't think Noah Fant is as good as Cortland Sutton. I do think still that Sutton is the number one over Jerry Judy, but I'll talk about Jerry Judy again in a second. And then at running back, Melvin Gordon is splitting time probably with Javante Williams. So uh, I, I think that Cortland Sutton is probably their best offensive player. Then I'm going to give it to, to Von Miller on the defensive player of the year side. I feel like he's still the number one pass rusher, probably not for a whole lot longer. But otherwise, you could go Bradley Chubb. You could go Justin Simmons. So I do think that Von Miller still is a leader on his defense, uh, but you could potentially see the changing of the guard soon. As mentioned, Jerry Judy, I have him as my breakout player of the year for this team. I just don't see Drew Locke making a big enough impact to get it. Um, so I'm going to give it to Jerry Judy. I think he proves himself to be a top two receiver on this team, and his route running ability is very elite. Rookie of the year is honestly a tough one. Even though it's clear Patrick Satan, best player as a rookie, absolutely solid. He was my number one corner, top 10 player in this class. He was uh, just one of my favorite players in this class. I just, 
I'm giving it to him, but I honestly don't know how often he's going to get on the field, which is why I would also say Javante Williams might be a better bet for rookie of the year, better player Patrick Sertan, but maybe Javante Williams ends up getting some more opportunities. But I am going to go with Sertan just because I feel like they need to get him in the mix somehow. He's too good not to. So in conclusion, I have the Broncos going 7-10, and uh, just, you know, missing the playoffs with that. So thank you so much for watching this video. We finally hit the 7 win mark for teams. I'm trying to get a hot streak going here videos. Uh, I'm trying my best. I don't know. It, I haven't done the math. It might, you know, even if I did one every day, we might not make it to the beginning of the season, but I think we'll be close. So I'm just going to keep grinding at this and hoping we can get as close as possible. So with, once again, thank you for watching this late into the video, and I will see you in the next one.